Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's showing of Inherit the Wind. My name is Elena Zemanek, and I am the student director of this production. Set in the early 20th century, Inherit the Wind is based off the actual events of the 1925 Scopes Monkey Trial in which a Southern teacher was arrested for teaching his students the evolution theory. The cast and crew is delighted that you have come tonight, and we hope you enjoy the production as much as we have creating it. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy Inherit the Wind. Hello, Rachel. Excuse the way I look. Not going away, are you? Excitement's just starting. Long as I've been barely here, we've had nothing but drunks, vagrants, and chicken thieves. Oh, and that fellow from Minnesota who chopped up his wife. We had to extradite. Oh, I want to see Bert. Is he all right? This ain't a very proper place for a minister's daughter. Mr. Meeker, don't let my father know I came here. The Reverend, don't tell me his business. Don't know why I should tell him mine. Go ahead. Seems kind of strange having a school teacher in the jail. Might improve the writing on the walls. I'll leave you two alone to talk. Don't run off, Bert. <coughs> Rach, I told you not to come here. I couldn't help it. I stopped by your house and picked up some of your things. Some clean shirts, your best hat, some handkerchiefs. Thanks. Bert, I can't bear the cut. You know what's funny? The food's better than the boarding house. You better not tell anybody how cool it is down here. We'll have a crime wave every summer. Bert, Matthew Harrison Brady's coming. On a special train out of Chattanooga. We ought to get everybody all steamed up, huh? Strike up the band. Bert, huh? it's still not too late. Why can't you admit you're wrong? If a great man like Mr. Brady comes here to tell the whole world how wrong you are. You still think I did wrong. Well, I just don't understand why. I was I... just doing my job, reading to my students from a textbook. Chapter 17, Darwin's Origin of Species. All it says is that man wasn't just stuck here like a geranium in a flower pot. That living comes from a long miracle. It didn't just happen in seven days. Well, there's a law against that. I know that. Everybody says what you did is bad. Rach, it isn't as simple as that. Good or bad, black or white, night or day. Do you know at the top of the world, the twilight is six months long? But we don't live at the top of the world. We live in Hillsboro, and when the sun goes down, it's dark. Why don't you try to make it different? Why can't you be on the right side of things? Father's side. <clears throat> I got a sweep. Imagine Matthew Harrison Brady coming here. 
I voted for him for president twice, in 1900 and again in 08. I wasn't old enough to vote for him the first time he ran, but my pa did. Who's gonna be your lawyer, son? I don't know yet. I wrote to that newspaper in Baltimore. They're sending somebody. He better be loud. I seen Brady once at a Chautauqua tent in Chattanooga. The tent pole shook. I bet the devil ain't so obliging. I don't intend to find out. Good morning, Reverend. Morning. Morning, Reverend. Mrs. Krebs. Where is the banner? Why haven't you raised the banner? Painted and dry till just now, Reverend. We'll see that you have it up before Mr. Brady arrives. Fast as we can do it, Reverend. You must show him at once what type of community this is. Yes, Reverend. Big day, Reverend. Indeed it is. Is the picnic lunch ready? Fit for a king. Station Master says old 94 is on time out of Chattanooga. Brady's on board, all right. The minute Brady gets here, people are going to pour in. Town's going to fill up like a rain barrel in a flood. That means business. Well, where are we going to stay? Where are we going to sleep all them people? Oh, they got money. We'll sleep them. Looks like the biggest day for this town since they put up Coxie's army. Hey, Ted Finney's got out his big bass drum. And you want to see what they done with the depot? Ribbons all over the rain spouts. Popcorn, get your popcorn. It's all ready, Reverend. Hot dogs, get your red hot. My stomach or my soul? My stomach. What are you, an infidel? A sinner? An evolutionist? Worse, I write for a newspaper. I'm E.K. Hornbeck, Baltimore Herald. Don't believe I caught your name? Well, they call me Elijah. Elijah, yes. yes. Well, I had no idea you were still around. I've read some of your stuff. Well, I neither read nor write. <laughs> oh, excuse me, I must be giving you another Elijah. <laughs> Wild, untamed, 
friends. And I can see that uh, most of you are my friends from the way that you have decked out your beautiful city of Hillsborough. Mrs. Brady and I are delighted to be among you. I only wish that you had not given us quite so warm a welcome. <laughs> oh, bless you. My friends of Hillsborough, I have come here not merely to prosecute a lawbreaker, but to defend that which is most precious in the hearts of all of us, the living truth of the Holy Scriptures. Amen. 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 I shall be happy to oblige the uh, sir. Oh, no, madam, not secretary. Uh, you are the mayor, are you not, sir? I am, sir. My name is Mr. Matthew Harrison Brady. This municipality is proud to have within its city limits the warrior who has fought for us ordinary people. The lady folk of this town have you to thank for that vote. Fine, give them all that suffrage and whatnot. Uh, Mr. President Wilson wouldn't have won the war or even got to the White House if it wasn't for you uh, supporting him. And so, in conclusion, the governor of our fine state has vested in me the authority. Cody? Thank you. Matt, you didn't have your pool on. Uh, perhaps we should have a more formal pose. Uh, tell me, uh, who is the spiritual leader of this community? Reverend Jeremiah Brown, your servant and the Lord's. Uh -huh, yes. The Reverend at my left, the mayor at my right. We must look grave, gentlemen, but not too serious. Hopeful, I believe is the word. We must look hopeful. Thank you. And so, in conclusion, the governor of our fine state has vested in me the authority to hereby appoint you as honorary uh, colonel in the state militia. I quite like the sound of that. We yes. thought you may be hungry, Colonel Brady, after your long train ride. So the members of our ladies' aid have prepared a buffet lunch. Oh, splendid, splendid. I, I could do it with this man. Oh, you know, Mr. Brady, Colonel Brady, all of your voted for you three times. I trust it was in three. A separate election. <laughs> Team, won't we, young lady? Quite a team. Ah, what a handsome repast. Mm. What a challenge it is to fit on the old armor again, to test the steel of our truth against the blasphemy of science, to stand. Matthew, it's a warm day. Remember the doctor told you not to overeat. Uh, don't worry, mother, just a bite or two. Now, uh, who among you knows the defendants? Uh, just about everybody in Hillsborough knows everybody else. Can anyone tell me? Is the fellow a criminal by nature? Our case isn't a criminal. Oh. He's good, really. He's just. Uh, when's my child? This is Mr. Cates, your friend. I can't tell you anything about him. Rachel, my daughter will be pleased to answer any questions you have about Bertram Cates. Your daughter, Reverend. You must be quite proud of being here. Now, uh, how did you come to be acquainted with Mr. Cates? At school. I'm a school teacher, too. And tell me. Has he ever tried to pollute your mind with his heathen dogma? This bird isn't a heathen. I understand your loyalty to a fellow school teacher, my child. Uh, think of me as a friend, Rachel, and uh, tell me what troubles you. Uh, who's going to be the defense attorney? Um, we don't know yet. It hasn't been announced. Well, whoever he is, he won't have much chance against your husband, will he, Mrs. Brady? <laughs> I disagree. Who are you? Hornbeck, E.K. Hornbeck, Baltimore Herald. Hornbeck? When the sovereign state determined to indict the sovereign mind of a less than sovereign school teacher, my editor decided there was more than a headline here. The Baltimore Herald, therefore, is happy to announce that it is sending two representatives to heavenly Hillsborough. The most brilliant journalist in America today, myself, <laughs> and the most agile legal mind of the 20th century, Henry Drummond. Oh, Henry, Henry Drummond. Drummond. <laughs> I heard about him the other day. He just got two Chicago child murderers off. Oh, Merry Christmas and a jolly Fourth of July. Henry Drummond. Well, Henry Drummond. Oh dear me. We will not allow him in this town. I'm not sure how you can keep him out. I'm sure we can find a town ordinance or something. You know what? I seen Brady once at a courtroom in Ohio. A man was on trial for a most brutal crime. And though he knew and admitted the man was guilty, he was perverting the evidence to turn the blame against you, me, and all of society. Maybe the board of hell. Ma'am, the rain had a drumming for the defense. Drummond? Henry Drummond? 
I was looking to his face. You wonder why God created such a man, and then you realize that God did not create him, but the devil. He perhaps even is the devil himself. We shall not allow him in this town. No, I have also seen his face. I believe we should welcome Henry Drum. Welcome! If the enemy sends its Goliath into battle, it only magnifies our cause. Henry Drummond has stalked the courtrooms of this land for over 40 years. When he fights, headlines follow. The whole world will be watching our victory over Drummond. Think of it this way. If Sir George had slain a dragonfly, who would remember him? <laughs> would you care to finish off the big lay for cause of history? It would be a pity to see them go. Mad, you think? Uh, I have to build up my strength, Mother, for the battle ahead. Now, uh, what will Drummond do? He'll try to make us forget the lawbreaker and put the law on trial. But we'll have the answers for Mr. Drummond right here. And some of the things this sweet young lady has told me. But, Mr. Brady, I... Fine girl, Reverend. Fine girl. Rachel has always been taught to do the righteous thing. I'm sure she has. Uh, thank you. A toast, then. A toast to tomorrow. Oh, thank you. To the beginning of our trial and to the success of our cause. A toast in good American lemonade. <laughs> We have a suite ready for you at the Madison House. I think you'll find your bags already there. Excellent. If you'll come with me, it's uh, just across the square. All right. Yes, yeah, sir. I'd like to thank all the members of the Ladies' Aid for preparing this nice little picnic repast. My pleasure, sir. And if I uh, seem to pick at my food, I don't want you to think I didn't enjoy it. We had a box lunch. <laughs> No more visitors. I give advice at remarkably low hourly rates. 10% off to unmarried daughters of the clergy. What are you doing here? I'm inspecting the battlefield the night before the battle, before it's cluttered with the debris of journalistic camp followers. I'm scouting myself at observation post to watch the fray. Wait. Bert Cates. What's he to you or you to him? Could it be that both beauty and biology are on our side? There's a newspaper here I'd like to have you see. It just arrived from that wicked modern Sodom and Gomorrah. Baltimore. Not the entire edition, of course. No funny pages. Merely the part worth reading. <coughs> My typewriter has been singing a sweet, sad song of the Hillsborough heretic, B. Cates. Boy Socrates, Latter-day Dreyfus, Romeo with the biology book. See, I may be rancid butter, but I'm on your side of the bread. This sounds as if you're a friend of Bert's. As much as a critic can be a friend to anyone. Have a bite? Oh, don't worry. I'm not the serpent, little Eva. This isn't from the tree of knowledge. You won't find one in the orchards of heavenly Hillsboro. Birches, beeches, butternuts, a few ignorance bushes, no tree of knowledge. Will this be published here in the local paper? In the weekly bugle or whatever it is they call that leaden stuff they blow through the local linotypes? I doubt it. It would help Bert if the people here could read this. It would help them understand. I never would expect you to write an article like this. You seem so cynical. That's my fascination. I do hateful things for which people love me and lovable things for which they hate me. I am the friend of enemies, the enemy of friends. I am admired for my detestability. I am both poles and the equator with no temperate zones in between. You make it sound as if Bert's a hero. I'd like to think that, but I can't. A school teacher is a public servant. I think you should do what the law and the school board want you to. If the superintendent comes to me and says, Miss Brown, which would a teacher from Whitley's second reader, I don't feel I have to give him an argument. Ever give your pupils a snap quiz on existence? What? Where we are, where we came from, where we're going. All the answers to those questions are in the Bible. All? 
You feed the youth of Hillsboro from the little truck garden of your mind? I think there must be something wrong with what Bert believes if a great man like Mr. Brady comes here to speak out against him. Matthew Harrison Brady came here to find himself a stump to shout from. That's all. You couldn't understand. Mr. Brady's the champion of ordinary people like us. Wake up, Sleeping Beauty. The ordinary people played a dirty trick on Colonel Brady. They ceased to exist. Time was when Colonel Brady was the hero of the hinterland. Water boy for the great unwashed, but they've got inside plumbing in their heads these days. Colonel Brady's virginal small towner has been had by Marconi and Montgomery Ward. <laughs> sure you don't want a bite? Awful good. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good in for me. It was good enough for father. It was good enough for father. It was good enough for father. It's good enough for me. It was good for the Hebrew children. It was good for the Hebrew children. It was good for the Hebrew children. It's good enough for me. Hot night, Mrs. McLean. I thought we'd get some relief when the sun was down. Me too. Sundays. That's good enough for the prosecution. Your Honor, I accept this woman as a member of our jury. One moment, Mrs. Bannister. You're not excused. Mr. Drummond? I wanted that there front seat in the jury box. Well, hold your horses, Bannister. You may get it yet. Uh, how come you're so anxious to get that front seat there? Well, everybody says this is going to be quite a show. <laughs> I hear the same thing. You ever read anything in a book about evolution? No. Well, I bet you read your Bible. No. How come? I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are fortunate. She'll do. Take your seat, Mrs. Bannister. Jesse H. Dunlap, you're next, Jesse. Uh, your Honor, it's been called to my attention that the temperature is now 97 degrees Fahrenheit and it may be getting hotter. I do not believe that the dignity of the court will suffer if we remove a few superfluous outer garments. Does the defense object to Colonel Brady's motion? Well, I, I don't know if the dignity of this court can be maintained with these galluses I've got on. Well, we'll take that chance, Mr. Drummond. Those who wish to remove their coats may do so. The counsel for the defense showing us the latest fashion in the great metropolitan city of Chicago. I'm glad you asked me that. It just so happens I bought these galluses at Peabody's General Store in your hometown, Mr. Brady, Weeping Water, Nebraska. Let us proceed with the selection of the final juror. State your name and occupation. Jesse H. Dunlap, farmer and cabinet maker. You believe in the Bible, Mr. Dunlap. I believe in the holy word of God, and I believe in Matthew Harrison Brady. Amen. 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 That's good enough for the prosecution. Colonel Drummond? No questions. Not accepted. Does Mr. Drummond refuse this man a place on the jury simply because he believes in the Bible? 
you can find an evolutionist in this town, you can refuse him. Your Honor, I object to the defense attorney rejecting a worthy citizen without so much as uh, asking him a question. All right, I'll ask him a question. How are you? Kind of hot. Me too. Excuse. I object to the note of levity which the counsel for the defense is introducing into these proceedings. The bench agrees with you in spirit, Colonel. And I object to all this damn Colonel talk. I am not familiar with Mr. Brady's military record. Well, he was made an honorary Colonel in our state militia the day he arrived in Hillsboro. The use of this title prejudices the case of my client calls up an image of the prosecution, a stride a white horse, a blaze in the uniform of a militia colonel, with all the forces of right and righteousness marshaled behind it. Well, what are we to do? Break him. Make him a private. <laughs> I have no serious objection to the honorary title of private, Brady. Well, we can't take it back. I, uh, well, I'm sure the governor won't mind. Mr. Drummond, I hereby appoint you as temporary honorary colonel in the state militia. <laughs> Gentlemen, I don't know what to say. It's not often in a man's life that he attains the exalted rank of temporary honorary colonel. I thank you. <clears throat> colonel Brady, Colonel Drummond, you will examine the veneering. State your name and occupation. George Sillis, I work at the feed store. Tell me, sir, do you, what do you call yourself a religious man? Well, I guess I'm as religious as the next man. In Hillsborough, sir, that means a great deal. <coughs> now, uh, tell me, do you have any children, Mr. Sillis? Not as I know of. <laughs> <laughs> and if you had a son or a daughter, what would you think if that sweet young child came home and told you that a godless teacher? Objection. <laughs> Now we're supposed to be choosing jury members. The prosecution is denouncing the defendant before the trial has even begun. Objection sustained. <clears throat> Mr. Sillers, will you merely tell us some of your opinions with regard to the defendant that may uh, prejudice you on his behalf? Kate's? Well, I don't hardly know him. He did buy some Pete Moss for me once and paid his bill. Uh, Mr. Sillers impresses me as an honest, God-fearing man. I accept it. Thank you, Colonel Brady. Colonel Drummond? Now, uh, Mr. Sillers, I just heard you say that you were a religious man. Well, tell me something. Uh, do you work at it very hard? Well, I'm pretty busy down at the feed store. My wife kind of tends to religion for the both of us. Oh, I see. So, uh, in other words, you take care of this life while your wife takes care of the next one. Objection! <laughs> Objection sustained. Tell me, Mr. Sillers, uh, while your wife was tending to the religion, uh, did you ever happen to bump into a fella named Charles Darwin? Not till recent. Well, uh, from what you've heard of this Darwin, do you think your wife would want to have him over for a Sunday dinner? I don't know. Your Honor, my uh, worthy opponent seems to be cluttering the issue with uh, hypothetical questions. I'm doing your job, Colonel. The prosecution is perfectly able to handle in its own arguments. Look. I've just established that Mr. Sillers isn't working very hard at religion. Now, for your sake, I want to make sure he isn't working at evolution. I'm just working at the feed store. <laughs> <laughs> this man's all right. Take a box seat, Mr. Sillers. Your Honor, I am not altogether satisfied that Mr. Sillers will render impartial judgment in this trial. Out of order. The prosecution has already accepted this man. Now, all I want is a fair trial. So do I. Unless the state of mind of the members of the jury conform to the laws and patterns of society. Oh, conform, conform. What do you want to do? Run the jury through a meat grinder so they all turn out the same? Your Honor. I've seen what you can do to a jury. Don't think that anybody's forgotten the Endicott publishing case where you made the jury believe that the obscenity was in their own minds and not in the printed page. How you twisted and tangled them. All I want is to prevent the clock stoppers from dumping a load of medieval nonsense in the United States Constitution. Oh, yeah. Damn it, you gotta stop them somewhere. Gentlemen, if you please, you are both out of order. The court has ruled that the jury has been selected. Owing to the lateness of the hour and the unusual heat, 
the court shall be recessed until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Oh, the Reverend Brown has asked me to announce that, that there will be a prayer meeting tonight on the courthouse front lawn. We pray for justice and guidance. All invited. Your Honor, I object to this commercial announcement. Commercial announcement? For Reverend Brown's product. Why don't you announce that there will be an evolutionist meeting? There is no such a meeting. Well, that's understandable. It's bad enough that everyone walking into this courtroom has to walk underneath a banner that says, Read your Bible. <laughs> I want that sign taken down. Or else I want another one put up. Just as big, saying, Read your Darwin. <laughs> Colonel Drummond, you are out of order. The court stands recessed. Of the indictment. Let me see. Oh, you have the old one. Let me have the new one. Here. Mr. Drummond, why can't Bert just go up to everybody and say, I did wrong, I broke a law. I admit it, I won't do it again. Then they'd stop all this fuss and everything would be like it was. Who are you? I'm a Friend of Bert's. Well, how about it, boy? Getting cold feet? I never thought it would be like this. Like Barnum and Bailey coming to town. You want to quit? Yes. People look at me as if I was worse than a murderer. That fellow from Minnesota who killed his wife, remember, Rach? Half the town turned out just to watch him put him on the train. They just, they just stared at him as if he was some sort of curiosity. Not like they hated him. My friends look at me now as if I had horns growing out of my head. Your murder a wife isn't nearly as bad as murdering an old wives' tale. Kill one of their fairy tale notions, they'll call down the wrath of God, Brady, and the state legislature. You make a joke out of everything. You seem to think it's all so funny. Lady, when you lose the power to laugh, you lose the power to think straight. Mr. Drummond, I can't laugh. I'm scared. Good. You'd be a damned fool if you weren't. You don't care a thing about Bert. You just want a chance to make speeches against the babble. And I care a great deal about Bert. I care a great deal about what Bert thinks. Well, I care about what the people in this town think of him. Can you buy back his respectability by making him a coward? I understand what Bert's going through. It's the loneliest feeling in the world to find yourself standing up while everyone else is sitting down, to walk down an empty street listening to the sound of your own footsteps, shutters closed, blinds drawn, doors locked against you. You aren't sure whether you're walking towards something or just walking away. Cates, I'll change your plea and we'll call out this whole business on one condition. If you honestly believe that you've committed a criminal act against the citizens of this state and the minds of their children, then the hell with it. I'll pack up my grips and head back to Chicago where it's a cool 100 in the shade. Bart knows he's wrong. Don't you, Bart? Don't prompt the witness. What do you think, Mr. Drummond? Well, I'm here. That tells you what I think. Well, what's the verdict, Bert? You want to find yourself guilty before the jury does? No, sir. I'm not going to quit. Bert! It wouldn't do any good now, anyhow, Rach. If you stick by me, we can fight it out. Mr. Brady says, I... What does Mr. Brady say? They want me to testify against Bert. You can't. Bert, I don't Rach, need to rush, but we got to close up shop. Some of the things I've talked to you about are things you just say to your own heart, like, 
trying to figure out what the stars are for, or it might be on the back side of the moon. If you get up on the witness stand and say those things out loud, Bert, the questions rage. I was just asking questions. If you get up there on this stand, Brady will make them sound like answers. And they'll crucify me. Can they make me testify? Well, I'm afraid so. Don't let Brady scare you. He only seems to be bigger than the law. It's not Mr. Brady. It's my father. Who's your father? Reverend Brown. I used to feel this way when I was a little girl, frightened. I wanted to run to my father and have him tell me that everything was going to be all right. But I was always more afraid of him. It's the same way now. Is your mother dead? I never knew my mother. Is it true? Is Bert wicked? Bert Cates is a good man, maybe even a great one. And it takes strength for a woman to love such a man, especially when he's a pariah in the community. I'm only confusing him. He's confused enough as it is. Well, the man who has everything figured out is probably a fool. Called examination is not notwithstanding. It takes a very smart fellow to say, I don't know the answer. What are we going to do about that sign? The devil don't run this town. Leave it up. I hope that you will tell the readers of your newspaper that here in Hillsboro we are fighting the fight of the faithful throughout the world. A question, Mr. Brady? Uh, yes. Uh, where are you from, ma'am? London, sir. Roy just do they do Oh, excellent. I have many friends in the United Kingdom. What is your personal opinion of Henry Drummond? I'm glad you asked me that. I want it to be known that I bear no personal animosity towards Henry Drummond. There was a time when he and I were both on the same side of the fence. He offered me open support in my 1908 campaign, and I accepted it. But I say that if my own brother challenged the faith of millions, as Mr. Drummond is doing, I would oppose him still. I believe that's all for this evening, ma'am. Thank you. Miss Hornbeck. I've read some of your clippings. How flattering to know I'm being clipped. It grieves me to read reporting that's so biased. I'm no reporter, Colonel. I'm a critic. I hope you will be attending uh, Reverend Brown's prayer meeting this evening. It may bring you some enlightenment. Wouldn't miss it. Ah, Reverend Brown, good evening. I'm looking forward to our prayer meeting. You will find that our people are fervent in their belief. Now, I know it's warm out, but these night breezes can be treacherous, and you know how you perspire. Mother is always so worried about my throat. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. It's good enough for me. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. It's good enough for me. Brothers and sisters, I come to you on the wings of the word. The Lord's word is howling in the wind and flashing in the belly of the cloud. I hear it. I see it, Reverend. And we believe in the glory of the word. Glory to the Lord. Glory to the word. And the word tells us the world was created in seven days. Amen. Amen. In the beginning, the earth was void and without form. And the Lord said, let there be light. And there was light. Praise the Lord. Amen. And the Lord said, let there be firmament. And even as he spoke it, it was so. Amen. Amen. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And on the third day brought he forth the dry land and the grass and the fruit tree. And the fourth day, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and he pronounced them good. Amen. 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 And on the fifth day he peopled the sea with fish and the air with fowl, and he made great way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he blessed them all. But on the morning of the sixth day, the Lord awoke and his eye was dark, and a scowl lay across his face, and he said, it is not good. Oh. It is not good enough. Oh. It is not finished. Oh. I shall make me a man. Lord 
said, yeah, thou art truth, for I have created thee in my image. Now go forward, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. Amen. Do we believe in the glory of the word? Yes. Do we curse the man who denies the word? Yes. Do we cast this sinner out of our midst? Yes. Do we call down hellfire on this man who sins against the word? Yes. O oh Lord of tempest and thunder, O oh Lord of righteousness and wrath, we pray you make unto us a sign and strike down this sinner. Strike him down. Let him feel the terror of thy sword for all eternity. Let his soul writhe in anguish and damnation. Help! Oh, Father, don't pray to the strong bird. No, no, no. Lord, we pray for the same curse on those who ask grace for this sinner, whether they be blood of my blood and flesh of my Reverend, flesh. Reverend Brown, I know it is your faith which makes you utter this, Perhaps it is possible to be overzealous, to destroy that which you wish to save, so that there's nothing left but emptiness. Now, remember the wisdom of Solomon in the book of Proverbs. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. Now, the Bible also tells us that God forgives his children, and that we, the children of God, should forgive each other. Now, my friends, return to your homes. The blessings of the Lord will be with you all. We were good friends once. I used to always be so glad of your support. There used to be such a, a mutuality of understanding and admiration. I mean, well, why is it, my old friend, that you've moved so far away from me? Motion is relative, Matthew. Perhaps it is you who have moved away by standing still. told you in the schoolroom. Well, he said at first that the earth was too hot for any life. Then it cooled off a mite, and cells and things begun to live. Uh, cells? How? Little bugs, like, in the water. Then the little bugs got to be bigger bugs, and they sprouted legs and crawled up on the land. And uh, uh, how long did this take, according to your professor? A couple million years. Maybe longer. Then comes the fishes and the reptiles and the mammals. Man's a mammal. Along with the dogs and the cattle in the field? Did he say that too, Howard? Yes, sir. Now, uh, in all this talk of slime and bugs and serpents, uh, where did man come out of this? Man was sort of evoluted from the old world monkeys. Well, did you hear that? Old world monkeys. <laughs> According to Mr. Cates, you and I weren't even descended from good American monkeys. <laughs> now, Howard, in all this talk of slime and bugs and ooze, did Mr. Cates ever make any reference to God? Not as I remember. Or the miracles he achieved in seven days, as according to the beautiful book of Genesis? No, sir. My fellow believers. Objection. I ask that the court remind the learned counsel that this is not a Chautauqua tent. He is supposed to be submitting evidence to a jury. They may not all believe what you wish us all to believe. Your Honor, I have no intention of making a speech. There is no need. I'm sure that everyone within the jury, everyone within the sound of this boy's voice is moved by his tragic confusion. He has been taught that he wriggled up 
from the filth and the muck below. I say that these Bible haters, these evolutionists, are brewers of poison, and that the legislatures of this sovereign state have them clearly labeled, be it in bottles or in books, the products that they attempt to sell. Amen. Now, if this law is not upheld, then this boy will become one of a generation sworn of its faith by the teachings of godless science. But if the full penalty of the law is meted out to Bertram Cates, then the faithful, the whole world over, who are listening and who are watching us here today, will call this courtroom blessed. Your witness, sir. Well, I sure am glad Colonel Brady didn't make a speech. Now, Howard, I heard you say that the world used to be pretty hot. That's what Mr. Kate said. Any hotter than it is right now, you think? I guess it must have been. Mr. Cates read it to us from a, book, from a book. Do you know what book? I guess Mr. Darwin thought it up. Now, do you figure anything's wrong about that, Howard? Well, a I don't know. Your Honor, the defense is asking a 13-year-old boy to hand out an opinion on the question of morality. I am trying to establish, Your Honor, that Howard or Colonel Brady or Charles Darwin or anyone in this courtroom, or you, sir, has the right to think. Colonel Drummond, the right to think is not on trial here. Well, with all respect to the bench, I hold that the right to think is very much on trial, and it is fearfully in danger in the proceedings of this courtroom. A man is on trial, a thinking man, and he is threatened with fine and imprisonment because he chooses to speak what he thinks. Colonel Drummond, would you please rephrase your question? Now, let me put it this way, Howard. All this fuss and feathers about evolution, do you think it hurts you any? Sir? What Mr. Cates told you. Did it hurt your game any? Affect your pitching arm? No, sir. I'm a lefty. A southpaw, eh? Still honor your father and mother? Sure. Haven't murdered anybody since breakfast after Objection! 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 I gotta think it over. Good for you. Now, um, your pa's a farmer, isn't he? Yes, sir. Got a tractor? Brand new one. Now, you figure a tractor's sinful because it isn't mentioned in the Bible? Don't know. You know, Moses never made a phone call. You suppose that makes the telephone an instrument of the devil? I never thought of it that way. And neither has anybody else. Your Honor, my worthy opponent makes the same old error of all godless men. He confuses material things with the spiritual realities of the revealed world. Why do you bewilder this child? Does right have no meaning to you, sir? Well, realizing that I may be prejudicing the case of my client, I must say that right has no meaning to me whatsoever. But truth has meaning as a direction. But one of the peculiar imbecilities of our time is the grid of morality we have placed on human behavior so that every act of man must be placed against an arbitrary latitude of right and a longitude of wrong in exact minutes, seconds, and degrees. So that... Uh, Howard, do you have any idea what I'm talking about? No, sir. Well, maybe you will. Someday. Thank you, son. Keep thinking. The witness is excused. We won't need you anymore, Howard. You can go back to your mom now. Next witness. Will Miss Rachel Brown step forward, please? Miss Brown, you are a teacher at the Hillsborough Consolidate School. Yes. So you have had ample opportunity to come to know the defendant, Mr. Cates, professionally? Yes. Now, uh, tell me, does Mr. Cates attend the same spiritual community as you? Objection. I don't understand this chatter about spiritual communities. 
If the prosecution wants to know if they go to the same church, why doesn't he ask that? Uh, objection overruled. You will answer the question, please. I did answer the question. Reporter, can you repeat the question, please? Do you and Mr. Cates attend the same church? Not anymore. Bert dropped out two summers ago. Why? It was what happened with little Stebbins boy. He used to come over to the boarding house and look through Bert's microscope. Bert said the boy had a quick mind. He might even be a scientist when he grew up. But he went swimming in the river and got a cramp and drowned. Bert felt awful about it. At the funeral, Paul preached that Tommy didn't die in the state of grace because his folks had never had him baptized. Tell him what you're... Tell him what your father really said. They told me soul was damned, writhing in hellfire. Can't you see it? Religion is supposed to comfort people, isn't it? Not frighten them to death. We will have order, please. Now, Your Honor, I request that the defendant's remarks be stricken from the record. But how can we strike this young man's bigoted opinions from the memory of this community? Now, go on, my dear. Uh, tell us some more of the conversations you had with Mr. Cates within the uh, regards to religion. Objection, objection, objection. Hearsay testimony is not admissible. The court sees no line, no objection to this line of questioning. Proceed, Colonel Brady. Will you merely repeat in your own words some of the conversations you had with Mr. Cates? I don't remember exactly. Uh, what you told me the other day, that presumably humorous remark that Mr. Cates made about the Heavenly Father. Humorous? I can't. <clears throat> May I remind you, Ms. Brown, that you are testifying under oath and that it is unlawful to withhold pertinent information? Bert was just talking about some of the things he read. He, he... Or were you shocked when he told you these things? Describe to the court your innermost feelings when Bert Kate said to you, yes, uh, God did not create man, man! created God. Bert didn't say that. He was just joking. What he said was God created man in his own image and man being a gentleman return the compliment. Go on, my dear. Uh, tell us some more. What did he say about the holy state of matrimony? Did he compare it with the breeding of animals? No, he didn't say that. He didn't mean that. That's not what I told you. All he said was, he said, Are you ill, Ms. Brown? Would you care for a glass of water? I believe that under the circumstances, the witness should be dismissed. And will the defense have no chance to challenge some of these statements the prosecution has put in the mouth of the witness? Let her go. No questions. For the time being, the witness is excused. Does the prosecution wish to call upon any further witnesses? Not at the current time, Your Honor. Then we shall proceed with the case for the defense. Colonel Drummond? Your Honor, I call Dr. Keller, head of the Department of Zoology at the University of Chicago. Objection. On what grounds? I wish to inquire what possible relevance a zoology professor can have in this trial. If Bertram Cates were accused of murder, would it be irrelevant to call expert witnesses to examine the weapon? Would you rule out expert testimony that the so-called murder weapon was incapable of firing a bullet? I fail to grasp the learned counsel. Well, Your Honor, the defense wishes to call Dr. Keller to the stand so that he may explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury exactly what the evolutionary theory is. Your Honor, I hold that the very law we are here to enforce excludes such testimony. I believe that the people of this state have made very clear that they do not want this zoological hogwash slobbered around in the schoolrooms. And I do not want these agnostic scientists to employ this courtroom as a sounding board, as a platform from which they can shout their heresies into the headlines. Amen. 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 Colonel Drummond, the court rules that zoology is irrelevant to the case. Agnostic scientists. Mm -hmm. When I call Dr. Page, deacon of the Congressional Church and professor of geology and archaeology at Oberlin College. Objection. Objection sustained. In one breath, does this court deny the existence of zoology, geology, and archaeology? We do not deny the existence of these sciences, but they do not relate to this point of law. And I call Mr. Aronson, philosopher, anthropologist, and author, one of the most brilliant minds in the world today. 
Objection, Colonel Brady. Uh, objection. Your Honor, the defense has called to Hillsborough the great thinkers of our time. Now, their testimony is vital to the case of my client. For it is my intent to show the people of this courtroom that what Bertram Cates spoke quietly one spring afternoon in Hillsborough High School is no crime. It is incontrovertible as geometry in every enlightened community of minds. In this community, Colonel Brahman, we do not need experts to question the validity of a law that is already on the books. In other words, this court rules out any expert testimony on Charles Darwin's origin of species of the descent of man. The court so rules. expert testimony regarding a book known as the Holy Bible. The Holy Bible. Any objection, Colonel Brady? If the uh, court can advance the case of the defendant through the use of the Holy Scriptures, why? the prosecution takes no exception. Good. Then I call to the stand one of the foremost experts of the Bible and its teachings. Matthew Harrison Brady. Well, this is highly unorthodox. I've never known an instance where the defense called the prosecuting attorney as a witness. Your Honor, this entire trial is unorthodox. If right and justice will be served, I will take the stand. The court will support you if you wish to decline to testify as a witness against your own case. Your Honor, I shall not testify against anything. I shall merely speak out, as I have my whole life, on behalf of the living truth of the Holy Scriptures. Amen. 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 Uh, Mr. Meeker, you better swear in the witness, please. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. And he will. That's right. It's right. Am I correct, sir, in calling on you as an authority on the Bible? I believe it is not boastful to say that I have studied the Bible as much as any layman, and that I have tried to live according to its precepts. Bully for you. Now. I suppose you can quote me chapter and verse right straight through King James Version, can't you? There are many portions of the Holy Bible that I have committed to memory. Now, I don't suppose you've memorized many of the passages from the origin of species. I'm not in the least bit interested in the, the pagan hypothesis of that book. I've never read it, and I never will. Then how in perdition do you have the gall to whoop up this holy war against something you don't even know anything about? How can you be so cocksure that the writings of Charles Darwin are in any way irreconcilable with the spirit of the book of Genesis? Would you state that question again, please? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me put it this way. On page 19 of The Origin of Species, Darwin's- I object to this, Your Honor. Colonel Brady has been called as an authority on the Bible. Now, this gentleman from Chicago uses this opportunity to read into the record Scientific testimony, which you, Your Honor, has previously ruled irrelevant. Amen. 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 We'll confine your questions to the Bible. All right. We'll play in your ballpark, Colonel. Now, let's get this straight. This is the book you're an expert on, right? That is correct. Now, tell me, uh, do you believe that? every word that's written in this book should be taken literally? Every word in the Bible should be accepted exactly as it is given there. Amen. Now, uh, take this passage where the whale swallows Jonah. Now, you figure that actually happened. The Bible does not say a whale. It says a big fish. <laughs> as a matter of fact, it says here a great fish. Yeah, but it's pretty much the same thing. What's your feeling about that? I believe in a God who can make a man and who can make a whale and make both do as he pleases. Amen! I want those amens on the record. Now, I recollect a story about Joshua making the sun stand still. Now, 
As an expert, you can tell me that's as true as the Jonah business, right? Well, that's a pretty neat trick. You suppose Houdini could do it? I do not question or scoff at the miracles of the Lord, as do ye of little faith. Have you ever pondered just what would naturally happen to the earth if the sun stood still? Well, you can testify to that if I get you on the stand. <laughs> Well, if they say that the sun stood still, they must have had the notion that the sun revolves around the earth. You think that's the way of things? Or don't you believe that the earth revolves around the sun? I have faith in the Bible. You don't have much faith in the solar system. The sun stopped. Good. Now, if what you say is factually true, Joshua halted the sun in the sky. That means that the earth stopped spinning on its axis, continents toppled over each other, Mountains flew into space, and the Earth, arrested in its orbit, shriveled to a cinder and crashed into the sun. Now, Miss Hornbeck, how come your paper missed that tidbit of news? Oh, why, they missed it because it didn't happen. But it must have happened, according to natural law. Or don't you believe in natural law, Colonel? Would you like to ban Copernicus from the classroom along with Charles Darwin? Pass a law banning all scientific knowledge since Joshua? Revelations, period. Now, natural law was born in the mind of the Heavenly Father. He can change it, cancel it, do as he pleases with it. It constantly amazes me that you apostles of science with all your supposed wisdom uh, fail to grasp this simple concept. Amen. Well, listen to this. Genesis 4 to 16. And Cain went out in the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife. Now, where the hell did she come from? <laughs> Who? Mrs. Cain. Cain's wife. If in the beginning there was only Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, where did this extra woman spring from? You ever figure that out? No, sir. I will leave the agnostics to hunt for her. <laughs> <laughs> Never bothered you? Never bothered me. Never tried to figure out? Nope. Figure somebody pulled off another creation over in the next county? The Bible satisfies me. It is enough. It frightens me to imagine the state of learning in this world if everyone had your driving curiosity. Now, this book goes into a lot of begats. And Aphrasad begat Salah, and Salah begat Abram, and so on and so on. Now, uh, these pretty important folks. They are the generations of holy men and women of the Bible. And uh, how do they go about all this begat? What do you mean? I mean, did people begat themselves in those days about the same way they get themselves begat today? Well, the process is about the same. I don't think your scientists have improved it any. <laughs> So in other words, these people were conceived and brought forth through the normal biological function known as sex. <gasps> now, uh, what do you think of sex, Colonel Brady? It is considered original sin. And all these holy people got themselves begat through original sin? All that sinning make them any less holy? He wants to. The court must be satisfied this line of questioning has some bearing on the case. You've ruled out all of my witnesses. I must be allowed to examine the one witness you left me in my own way. Your Honor, I am willing to sit here and endure Mr. Drummond's sneering and disrespect, for he is pleading his case of the prosecution by his contempt for all that is holy. I object, I object, I object. On what grounds? Is it possible that something is holy to the celebrated agnostic? Yes, the individual human mind. In a child's power to master the multiplication tables, there is more sanctity than all your shouted hosannas. An idea is a greater monument than a cathedral. And the advancement of man's knowledge is more of a miracle than any sticks turned to snakes or parting of waters. But are we now ready to halt the march of progress because Mr. Brady frightens us with a fable? Progress has never been easy. You gotta pay for it. 
Sometimes I think there's a man behind a counter who says, all right, you can have the telephone, but you'll have to give up privacy, the charm of distance. No matter, you may vote, but you lose the right to retreat behind a petticoat. And mister, you may conquer the air, but the birds will lose their wonder, and the clouds will smell of gasoline. Darwin moved us forward to a hilltop where we could look back and see the way from which we came. But for this view, this knowledge, this insight, our faith in the pleasant poetry of Genesis. We must not abandon faith. Faith is the most important thing. Amen. Then why did God plague us with the power to think, Mr. Brady? Why do you deny the one faculty which lifts man above all other creatures on this earth, the power of his brain to reason? What other merit have we? The horse is stronger and swifter, the butterfly more beautiful, even the simple sponge is more durable. Or does a sponge think? If the Lord wishes a sponge to think, it thinks. Then does a man have the same privileges that a sponge does? Of course. Then this man wishes to be accorded the same privileges as a sponge. He wishes to think. But your client is wrong. He is deluded. He has lost his way. It's sad that we aren't all gifted with your positive knowledge of right and wrong, Mr. Brady. Now, how old do you think this rock is? I am more interested in the rock of ages than I am in the age of rock. Amen. Amen. Now, Dr. Page of Oberlin College tells me that this rock, found in this very county, contains the fossil remains of a prehistoric marine creature that's at least 10 million years old. <laughs> well, well, Colonel Drummond, you've managed to sneak in some of that uh, scientific testimony in there after all. But I believe your professor is a little mixed on his dates. Why, that rock is no more than 6,000 years old. How do you know? A fine biblical scholar has determined that the Lord began creation on the 23rd of October, the year 4004 BC at 9 a.m. That Eastern Standard Time? <laughs> it wasn't daylight savings time, was it? Because the Lord didn't make the sun until the world until the fifth day. That is correct. And that first day, was it a 24-hour day? The Bible says it was a day. Now, if there wasn't any sun, how long do you know it was? The Bible says it was a day. Well, a normal day, a literal day, a 24-hour day? I do not know. Well, what do you think? I do not think about things that I do not think about. Well, do you ever think about the things that you do think about? <laughs> Isn't it possible that first day was 25 hours? There was no way to measure it, no way to tell. Could it have been 25 hours? It is possible. <gasps> then it could have been 30 hours, or a month, or a year, or a hundred years, or 10 million years. <laughs> He wants to destroy everybody's faith in the Bible and in God. That's not true and you know it. I'm just trying to stop you bigots and ignoramuses from controlling the education of the United States. Unless there is order here. How dare you attack the Bible? The Bible is a book, a good book, but it's not the only book. It is the revealed word of the almighty God spake to the men who wrote the Bible. And how do you know that God didn't spake to Charles Darwin? I know because God tells me to oppose the evil teachings of that man. Oh, God speaks to you. Yes. He tells you exactly what's right and what's wrong. Yes. And you act accordingly. Yes. So to be against Brady, is to be against God. No, 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 no. Each man is a free agent. Then what is Bertram Capes doing in the Hillsborough jail? <laughs> Suppose Mr. Capes had enough influence and lung power to railroad through the state legislature a law that only Darwin should be taught in the schools. Ridiculous, ridiculous. There is only one great truth in the world. The gospel according to Brady. God speaks to Brady and Brady tells the world. Brady, Brady, Brady Almighty! Lord, the Lord is my strength! Extend the testaments! 
Let us have a book of Brady. We'll slip you neatly in between numbers and Deuteronomy. My friends, your honor. My followers, the witness is excused. All of you know what I believe. I believe. I believe in the pleasant poetries of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, 1st Samuel, 2nd, 1st Kings, 2nd Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Michael, Nahum. Mother, I can't stand it when they laugh at me. It's all right, baby, it's all right. anybody from the outside, do they? In prison, I hear you can only talk to a visitor through a glass window, the way they show it in the movies. Well, it's not as bad as all that. He seems so sure. He seems to know what the verdict's going to be. Well, no one knows. You know, someday I'm going to get me an easy case, an open and shut case. I got a friend up in Chicago, a big lawyer. Lord, how the money rolls in. You know why? Because he never takes a case unless it's a sure thing. Like a jockey, he won't go into a race unless he can rise a favor. You sure picked the long shot this time, Mr. Drummond. Yeah, sometimes I think the law is like a horse race. I ride like fury just to end up back where I started. Might as well be on a merry-go-round or rocking horse or golden dancer. Golden dancer? That was the name of my first long shot. She was in the big side window of the general store. I used to stand there for hours and say to myself, if I had Golden Dancer, I'd have everything in the world. She had a bright red mane, blue eyes, and gold all over with purple spots. When the sun hit her stirrups, she was a dazzling sight to see. But she was a week's wages from my father. So Golden Dancer and I always had a plate glass window between us. But on my birthday, I woke up there was Golden Dancer at the foot of my bed. Ma had skimped on the groceries, and my father had worked nights for a month. So I jumped on the saddle and started to rock. And it broke, split in two. The wood was rotten. The whole thing was put together with spit and sealing wax. All shine, no substance. Bert, whenever you see something bright, shining, perfect semen, look behind the paint. If it's a lie, show it up for what it really is. We're making history here today, Your Honor. This is the first time a public event has ever been broadcast. Well, I'll allow it, provided you don't interfere with the business of the court. I think this is the best place to put it. That's all right with you, Your Honor. How should I know? There's no legal precedent for this sort of thing. No, I don't suppose there is. Merle, I gotta talk to you. The boys over at the state capitol are getting worried about the newspapers raising such a hullabaloo. After all, November is too far off. Don't do any of us any good to get the voters all steamed up. Wouldn't hurt just to let things simmer down. Well, go easy, Merle. Testing. One, two, three, four, five. Testing. One, two, three, four, five. Testing. One, two, three, four, five. What's that? An enunciator. We have a direct wire to WGN Chicago. When the jury comes in, we'll announce the verdict. Radio. God, this is gonna break down a lot of walls. You're, you're not supposed to say God on the radio. Why the hell not? You're not supposed to say hell either. You know, this is gonna be a barren source of amusement. Yes, sir. Uh, kindly signal me while I'm speaking if my voice does not have sufficient projection for your radio apparatus. Sir. Everybody rise.
The court will reconvene the case of the state versus Bertram Case. What do you think? Can you tell them the phrases? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Lily Brooks speaking to you from the courthouse in Hillsborough, where the jury is just returning to render its verdict in the famous Hillsborough monkey trial case. The judge has just taken the bench. And in the next few minutes, we shall know whether Bertram Case will be found innocent or guilty. <clears throat> Members of the jury, have you reached a decision? Yeah. Um, yes, sir, we have, Your Honor. The jury's decision is unanimous. Bertram Cates is found guilty as charged. Step right up and get your tickets for the Middle Ages. Well, you heard it. Bertram Cates has been found guilty as charged. I can tell you the confusion here is simply unbelievable. And now the next voice you will hear will be that of the judge actually pronouncing the sentence. The prisoner will rise to hear the sentence of this court. Bertram Cates, I hereby sentence you to uh, your honor. A question of procedure. Well, sir, it is not customary in this state to allow the defendant to make a statement before the sentence is passed. Colonel Drummond, I regret this omission. In the confusion and the neglect of Mr. Cates, if you wish to make any statement before a sentence is passed on you, why, you may proceed. Your Honor, I, I'm not a public speaker. I do not have the eloquence of some of the people you've heard in these last few days. I'm just a school teacher. Not anymore, you ain't. I've been convicted of violating an unjust law. I will continue in the future, as I have in the past, to oppose this law in any way that I can. Bertram Cates, since there's been no previous violation of this statute, there is no precedent in guiding events and passing sentence. The court deems it proper to have Bertram Cates pay a fine of $100. That is correct. This seems to conclude the business of the trial. Your Honor, the prosecution that takes exception where the issues are so titanic that we, the court, must make an example of this transgressor to show the world. Objection. Bertram Cates has no intention of paying this or any other fine. Let him go to jail then. Yes, yes, yes. We will appeal this decision to the Supreme Court of this state. Will the court grant 30 days to prepare our appeal? Granted. The court fixes bond at $500. I hereby declare this court as adjourned. Your Honor, with permission of the court, I'd like to read in the record a few short remarks which I've prepared. I object to that. Colonel Brady can make any remarks he likes, long, short, or otherwise in a Chautauqua tent, or in a political campaign. Your Honor, I, I have a few remarks that I would and like And I am to... sure everyone will remain to hear your address. I hereby declare this court as adjourned. Esmo Paz, get your Esmo Paz. Esmo Paz. Quiet, order on the, I mean your attention, please. We are honored to hear a few words from Colonel Brady, who wishes Esmo to address Esmo Paz, get your Esmo Paz. We beg your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Colonel Brady has some remarks to make, which I am sure will interest us all. My friends, my dear friends, from the hallowed hills of sacred Sinai, in the days of remote antiquity came the law that has been our bulwark and our shield. Excuse me, Age sir. upon age. Colonel Brady, some Yes, age upon age, man has looked to the law as they would look to the mountains. Ladies and gentlemen, Whence our time here is complete. And here, oh. Lily Brooks speaking. Here, we return you now to our studio. We have seen vindicated. We have seen vindicated. From the hallowed hills of sacred Sinai. Look at him. Get him across the street to Doc's office. be almost president three times with a skull full of undelivered inauguration speeches. Something happens to an also ran. Something happens to the feet of a man who always comes in second in a foot race. He becomes a national unloved child, a balding orphan.
Show me a shower and I'll show you an also ran. A mighty thing. An almost was. Did you see his face? He looked terrible. I'm surprised more folks ain't killed over in this heat. What's the matter, boy? Did I win or did I lose? You won. But the jury found me. What jury? What's well, 12 against millions? An entire nation will read in their newspapers tonight that you smashed a bad law. You made it a joke. Yeah. But what's going to happen now, sir? I haven't got a job. But they won't even let me back into the boarding house. Well, it's not going to be any church social for a while, but you'll live. And while they're making you sweat, remember, tomorrow, sure as hell, somebody else will have to stand up. And you've helped give them the guts to do it. Mr. Meeker, don't you have to lock me up? They fixed bail. You don't expect a school teacher to have $500. Someone else put up the money. For the year's subscription to the Baltimore Herald, we give away, at no cost or obligation, a year of freedom. Rach! Rach, I won't be needing any more shirts. I'm free for a while anyway. These are my things, Bert. I'm leaving. Where are you going? I'm not sure. Away from my father. Rach. Bert, it's my fault the jury found you guilty. I read your book, Bert, all the way through. I don't understand it. What I do understand, I don't like. I don't want to think that men came from apes and monkeys, but I think that's besides the point. That's right. It's besides the point. I was always afraid of what I might think, so it seems safer not to think at all. But now I know. A thought is like a child inside our body. It has to be born. If it dies inside you, part of you dies too. Maybe what Mr. Darwin said is bad. I don't know. Bad or good, it doesn't make any difference. The ideas have to come out, like children. Some of them healthy as a bean plant, others sickly. I think the sickly ideas die mostly, don't you, Bert? Brady's dead. I can't imagine a world without Matthew Harrison Brady. What caused it? Did they say? Matthew Harrison Brady died of a busted belly. Enough! Why should we weep for him? He wants enough for himself. The national tear duct that flooded the nation like a one-man Mississippi. You know what he was? A Barnum Bocum Bible-beating bastard. You smart aleck. You have no more right to spit on his religion than you have the right to spit on my religion. Or my lack of it. Well, what do you know? Colonel Drummond for the defense. Even of his enemies. There was much greatness in this man. Shall I put that in the obituary? Write anything you damn please. How do you write an obituary for a man who's been dead? 30 years. He wrote his own obituary. Here it is. His book. Proverbs, wasn't it? He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind, and a fool shall be servant to wise in heart. Well, well, Colonel Drummond. We're growing an odd crop of agnostics. I'm getting damned tired of you, Hornbeck. Why? You never pushed a noun against a verb except to blow up something. That's a typical lawyer's trick, accusing the accuser. What am I accused of? I charge you with contempt of conscience, self-perjury, kindness afterthought, sentimentality in the first degree. Why? Because I refuse to erase a man's lifetime? Brady had the same right as Kate's, the right to be wrong. Be kind to bigot, sweet. Since Brady's dead, we must be kind. God, how the world is rotten with kindness. A giant once lived in that body. But Matt Brady got lost. Because he was looking for God too high up, too far away. You hypocrite. You fraud. You're more religious than he was. Excuse me. I must get me to a typewriter and hammer out the story of an atheist who believes in God. Drummond. Bert, 
I am resigning my commission in the state militia. I hand in my sword. Doesn't it cost a lot of money for an appeal? I, I couldn't pay you. Well, I didn't come here to get paid. Well, I better get myself on a train. There's one out at 513. I'll get my stuff. I'll help you. Uh, say, uh, you forgot your... <laughs> 